It is fitting that there be something special said to young married couples. There is nothing more beautiful in this world than two young people in love. Now, in order that their love may endure, the fourth tension is the tension between sex and love. Now, when we speak of this tension, it must not be assumed that the two are opposites. They are not. When we speak of them here separately, it is because we are referring to those who separate sex from love. In married life, the two are to be united. Sex is the highest expression of the love between husband and wife. But when the two are not correctly understood or when they are divorced, then we find these differences. Sex seeks the part, love the totality. Sex is biological and has its very definite zones of satisfaction. And love, on the contrary, includes all of these, but is directed to the totality of the person loved, the totality, namely the person made of body and soul and created to the image and likeness of God. Love sees the clock and its purpose. Sex concentrates on the mainspring and forgets that it was made to keep time. An organ does not include the personality, but the personality includes the organ, which is another way of saying love includes sex, but sex does not necessarily include love. Love concentrates on the object, sex on the subject, namely on the self. Love is directed to someone else for the sake of the other's perfection. Sex is directed to self for the sake of self-satisfaction. Sex flatters the object, not because it is praiseworthy in itself, rather as a solicitation. It knows how to make friends and to influence people. The ego in sex pleads that it loves the, the other person. But what it really loves is the projection of the ego and the self into the other person. And that is quite a different thing. Sex is moved by a desire to fill a moment between having and not having. It is an experience like looking at a sunset or twirling one's thumbs to pass the time. And it rests after an experience, being glutted for the moment, and then waits for reappearance of the new passion to be satisfied on an entirely different object sometimes. Now love frowns on this notion, for it sees in this nothing but the killing of the objects loved for the sake of self-satisfaction. Sex would give birds flight, but no nests. It would give hearts emotions, but no homes. It would throw the whole world into the experience of voyagers at sea, but with no ports. Instead of purifying an infinite which is fixed, namely God, it substitutes the false infinite and never finds satisfaction. One of the reasons why so many suffer from psychosis and neuroses is because they're in a fruitless and constant search for the infinite in the finite or God in carnality. How different is real love? Real love admits the need, the thirst, the passion, the craving, but it also admits a real adhesion to a value that transcends all space and all time. In love, poverty becomes integrated to riches. In real love, the need becomes a fulfillment, and the yearning becomes a joy. But sex is without that joy of offering. The wolf offers nothing when it kills the lamb, because the joy of oblation is missing. Sex receives so as not to give, but love is sole contact with another for the sake of perfection. To sum it all up, you will feel a tension, therefore, between the romance and the marriage, between the chase and the capture. Is there any way of ever combining the two? To have always the thrill of the romance and always the thrill of the capture. Yes, there is, but not in this world. The only real answer to this paradox of the chase and the capture is to be found in eternity. When your love leads you back then you will capture something so infinitely ecstatic that it will take an eternity of chase to discover its meaning. Understand that, and you will know that as husband and wife, all the love that you have is just a spark, which is to lead you up to the flame, which is God. 
and your marriage will become like a tuning fork to the song of the angels. It will be like a river that runs into the sea, where the romance and the marriage fuse into one. For since God is boundless eternal love, it will take that eternal chase to sound its depths. One and the same moment, there will be in heaven a limitless receptivity and a boundless gift. This is what you marry for, for love. And love leads you to God. Therefore, you see, marriage is not just a contract. It is a union, and a union that has been made by God, and a union that endures until death. Here we are limiting ourselves to the human order. But you know very well from this encyclopedia of Catholic knowledge so far that there is not only a natural order, there's also a supernatural order. We live not only in the order of the human, but we can also live in the order of the divine. In addition to physical life, there is biological, or rather supernatural life, which is grace. And grace is that participation in the divine nature by which our intellects are illumined with faith and our wills are strengthened with power. Our blessed Lord, coming to this earth, bringing divine life, being the source of grace through his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, makes marriage a sacrament. That is to say now to those who are united in his church, he gives them the grace, the strength, the power to live out their mutual existence. Being a sacrament, it has two elements, just like every other sacrament. One is very visible and evident. It is the exchange of consent, which is signified not only by the joining of hands, but also by the words of consent. And this is witnessed by a priest. There is the invisible grace also, which is communicated for their married state. And because this grace symbolizes another marriage, marriage of Christ and his church. That is the meaning of sacramental marriage. This needs considerable explanation. You'll find it written all through the epistles of St. Paul. Uh, for example, here we quote uh, Paul, it is unheard of that a man should bear ill will to his own flesh and blood. No, he keeps it fed and warmed. So it is with Christ and his church. The two will become one flesh. Yes, these words are a high mystery. I am applying them here to Christ and the church. And he says in another place, Husbands, love your wives. Now how? As Christ loves the church. We come here to a very profound reason. As St. Paul calls it, as you see, a high mystery. The reason why the marriage of baptized persons in the church signifies another marriage. But all through the Old Testament and in the New, God expresses his relationship with man in terms of nuptials. In the Old Testament, God always spoke of himself as the bridegroom, as the husband of Israel, which was the kahal. So Israel, or the chosen people, or the kahal, was considered by God in the Old Testament as the bride of God. If we had time, we would give you many, many passages in the Old Testament to show how God could find no other symbol of his love for the kahal and for Israel and for the vehicle of his revelation uh, than the symbolism of married love. In the due course of time, God becomes man. In other words, the bridegroom becomes man. Well, did our Lord ever call himself the bridegroom? Yes, he did. And he did it in such a very natural way that the people were not at all astounded when they heard him, because they knew the background of God being related to their people as the bridegroom. One of the occasions in which our blessed Lord spoke of himself that way was when a question was hurled at him as to why his disciples did not fast, whereas the disciples of John the Baptist did fast. The answer of our Lord was, can you expect the men of the bridegroom's company to go fasting when the bridegroom is still with them? And he went on to say that the bridegroom would be taken away. John the Baptist called himself the friend of the bridegroom. In other words, a kind of best man. I think there's a beautiful mystery hidden somewhere in the marriage feast of Canaan 
Our Lord began his public life by assisting at that marriage feast to typify that his relationship with his church would be exactly like the relationship unfolded in the Old Testament. And when therefore the old Kahal of Israel became the new Kahal or the church or the new Israel through redemption and Pentecost, we had the continuation of this symbolism. Eve was the continuation of the body of man, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. What is the church? Church in the New Testament is described as the new Eve because the continuation of the new Adam, Christ. Everywhere there's the idea of espousals, body, oneness. But we must get first things first. Remember that the union of our Lord and the church is not like a human marriage. Rather, a human marriage is like the union of our Lord and the church. When therefore the bridegroom and bride stand at the altar, and we read to them the marriage ceremony, we are informing them, you, the bridegroom, stand for Christ, and you, bride, stand for the church. That is the mysterious grace that is conferred upon you. How beautiful marriage becomes. Scripture also goes on to tell us that just as Christ is the head of the church, so man is the head of a woman. Perhaps I should have put that the other way around. Suppose I just said that man is the head of woman, very often when women read that passage in scripture, they do not like it. But they should read what follows, that man is the head of a woman in exactly the same way that Christ is the head of the church. Now, how was our Lord the head of the church, the head of his bride? Well, he was the head by dying and sacrificing himself and pouring out his blood. The headship was based upon self-forgetfulness for the sake of the beloved. Now, how is the wife related to the husband? Well, she is related to the husband in the same way that the church is related to our blessed Lord. And as the husband is to sacrifice himself, for the wife, so too the wife, like the church, is to be related to her husband, just as the church to our Lord through love, service, devotion, and striving for perfection. Perhaps one of the reasons why a woman's head must always be covered in church is to signify that man is the head of the woman as Christ is the head of the church. In other words, there is something over the head of a woman, namely her husband, as there is something over the church, the head of the church, namely Christ himself. That is not superiority. That is sacrifice. God love.